Stanford University. We'll hear from five different purveyors. Purveyor, at least in Europe, is a really good word. If you're the purveyor to the Royal Court of Windsor for some kind of beer, that's really, that must be really good beer. So if you're a purveyor of a vehicle technology, that means you've got a good client. And since Bob, who was the first, who was the first company who said we'd be part of this, did get to give his whole talk, he'll be the last. Then Britt Williams, who works in the next office of me in the bottom of a uh, seminary at UC Berkeley, who's been involved with Toyota doing some, some, some testing and other, other, other research it's, it's for a long time involved in advanced vehicles. I'll get, in a sense, Bob, Bob will finish from the manufacturers and then Brett will give kind of a, a closing perspective and then we have time for discussion. And remember the format is then we have a, a, a sizable break and then we will in groups, so you'll be split up into groups and you'll, you'll get to cluster around each vehicle where, with one exception, somebody you see will explain something about the vehicle, and you can ask the really deep questions, particularly the ones you don't want to ask that, that the guy's not going to answer if the others are listening. And that's, that's fair, because after all, four of these are competitors, and if you listen carefully to what Jonathan Weinert was saying, e-bikes are actually a meaningful uh, choice too, and it may be that e-bikes get some of the market in the U.S., let me start with Marcus Hayes then. Marcus is uh, the founder of PI Mobility, PI or P, uh, no, PI, sorry. A, 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 a developer and manufacturer of light electric vehicles and propulsion technologies uh, and has been involved with CalStart since 1996. And I want to thank Jamie and his boss who, who, who landed Marcus for us. How many of you have seen an e-bike? Okay, so you see, so it's no longer a, a total oddity then I'm glad that Marcus will join us. Marcus, what are the technological breakthroughs you need and what are the policies you need? From a policy perspective, Ray LaHood's announcement on incorporating bicycles as part of, and pedestrians, of course, as part of the broader transportation scheme is exactly the kind of policy that makers of electric bikes need. And with any luck, you know, for any of us who've ever ridden on a bike path or bike lane, and, the terminus is a sign that reads, um, bike path ends, but you, if you're on the bike, want to keep going. I think that's a, a favorable policy shift. So I believe with, uh, with more bike paths and lanes, we have a chance to, uh, to achieve real numbers in, in bikes here in the U.S. What about, the, one of the things that was in Jonathan Weiner's talk was the contrast on the technology side. Are you waiting for the cheap non-lead battery? Having been in the electric vehicle business, stating, uh, as I cite in the bio to CalStart 1996, there were a lot of e-bikes that were incorporating lead-acid batteries, and it was clear to anyone who was a cyclist that that was a bad idea, of just if for no other reason than the weight. Certainly the lead um, doesn't necessarily make a good electric bike either. Uh, the Pi design specifically was oriented around the coming age of Fortunately, what we see today are reliable and relatively low-cost lithium, lithium cells. So our intersection of opportunity is uh, made possible with the lithium battery and, and the chemistry that it is currently offered in. So we're all systems go at this stage, and uh, we don't see any reasons why we can't uh, grow, grow rapidly. To emphasize the first answer, how many of you remember the segue? One reason the Segway bombed is there was no place for it to be. It was too fast for the sidewalk and too slow for the roadway. And so the DC, Washington DC cops use them, right? So I, I'm, I'm glad that you pointed out that you need space. And it, it, at least from the China example, it looks like you're going to get the space. They certainly are. In bicycle oriented cultures, adoption is an order of magnitude below what adoption here will require. But yes, with any luck, again, we get those bike paths and lanes working. And, and then the, bike, the electric bicycle becomes a real alternative to the automobile. At least I, I can say that our customers are, are mostly moving laterally from cars. So we're you know, seeing some, some data that supports that. OK, let's move from, if, if I could say it bluntly, the least powered of the electrical vehicles you can get to the most powerful one you can get. Zach, 
By the way, two Stanford faculty have uh, Tesla Roadsters. That either says that there's a good deal if you live down here, or we must pay ourselves a huge amount of money. You tell us where, where, where Tesla is at in terms of technology and policy. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with policy because that's one that's uh, um, a little bit more challenging to discuss. Uh, th there's a number of policy changes that could help the, um, the adoption of electric vehicles. Um, we've, we've seen a few already implemented, such as the federal tax credits for, uh, for purchasing electric vehicles. Um, if you were to buy a, um, a fully electric car like the Tesla Roadster, you get a $7,500 federal tax credit, which is, uh, which is certainly helpful. Um, but, but if you were to look at just one policy that you could implement, um, the primary policy would be a meaningful gas tax. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is our, our gasoline is cheaper than any really any nation in, in the world. With it's cheaper exceptions. than our bottled water. Well, yeah, cheaper than a number of products. Um, you, you know, if you look at a country like Venezuela, of course, they'll have cheap gas because it's subsidized and, and produced in, or brought out of the ground there primarily. But if you go over to Europe, you're looking at gas prices closer to $8 a gallon, $6 a gallon, up to even $10 a gallon. Um, and, and what that does is, is it, it really puts the true cost against, uh, you know, the, the cost of using gasoline in our, um, in our environment as well as socioeconomic, or I should say geopolitically. Um, you know, there's, there's a big cost to, to drilling oil and, and refining it and using it in, in cars. Um, you know, we, we go off and we fight wars for it as well as, uh, you know, we're, we're emitting a lot of, really a lot of um, pollutants that we don't need to be because there are alternatives as we know. So the, the gas tax will accomplish um, you know, put an appropriate price on, on gasoline usage. But I think equally importantly, it, um, it makes consumers demand the products. So they're not being forced on the consumer as, you know, uh, again, um, the CAFE legislation that came in recently, the corporate average fuel economy, um, increasing the requirements for manufacturers is great. But it's, it's again, it's putting a, um, it's a forcing mechanism to, to force the products on the consumer versus the consumer demanding it for the right reasons, which is gasoline has, has a higher cost than we re recognize today. And so having the consumer actually pull that, um, you know, pull the demand through instead of it being forced upon them is, is really important for adoption. Um, you know, then the manufacturers of, of vehicles will want to produce these because consumers are asking for them. Let's try to cycle through everybody. Then we have lots of time for questions, <laughs> fighting, to throw things, you know. Okay, that, that's very good because not a, lot of, a lot of people would not be willing to say that with an audience. Okay. I can say it because I'm on the faculty, right? <laughs> yeah, but I'm no, not tenured. I mean, I'm just kind of... No, and it's, it's, I mean, it's something that, um, you know, that Tesla believes in, and that's why we produce only zero-emission vehicles and, and electric vehicles. And um, you know, I, like many of you, drive cars that, that burn gasoline or some other petroleum product. So there's, there's, um, there's a short-term cost associated with that, but again, if, if I had to pay more for more at the pump. If I was in Europe, I wouldn't be driving the car I, I am today. Um, and I, I think that's true of a lot of us in here. Well, I lived on a bike in Paris for six and a half years and rented a car four times. Uh, broke my arm once, but that's a separate issue. <laughs> was that recently, maybe? <laughs> no, this is a rotator cuff from trying to pick yogurt off the shelf in the Safeway. You don't want to hear any more. <laughs> But I will acknowledge as we move to our next speaker from Toyota that when I was told no biking for months, uh, Toyota was able to lend me one of their Priuses. Part of the reason was they have a lot of them around right now, I guess. But it's actually, it's actually great because, no, because, because the worst thing you can do is drive a conventional gasoline car a mile to BART. Why? Because cold starts. Yeah. And one of the advantages of a hybrid is you have less of a problem with the emissions in cold start, particularly when you have an electric assist when you start up. Uh, Justin Ward has been, and he, you live in Sacramento, right? I, I used to. I've been actually transferred to Torrance now, Southern California. But what's really important is the number of automobile companies globally, including Volkswagen, who have important offices in Sacramento. Can anybody guess why? <laughs> Because where are the most important rules for global autom automobilization made today? Sacramento. At least until the state is auctioned off on East Bay. 
<laughs> what you didn't get to hear me say earlier to the class was that the interesting thing about a plug-in hybrid is that it can be either an almost Tesla, in the sense you can try to stay in the low-cost battery electric mode, or you can floor it and be more in the conventional Prius or all gasoline mode. So in some sense, it's a social test of what consumers want, where the choice is made, in a sense, by, by their pedal. And I also suggested that maybe we should think of the various vehicles here as different operating systems, not just it's all the same from the point of view of the driver and there's something, a black box. What has to happen for the technology, particularly for plug-in hybrids? We tried to get the Volt. The Volt was somewhere else because it, it's a different, a different approach, as we yeah. talked about earlier. Absolutely. What has to happen to the technology, do you think? And again, how will the policies push us towards this middle road rather than to a choice one way or the other? Uh, well, well, regarding plug-in technology, there's a lot of variability in plug-in technology. How do you implement plug-in technology? What is the best way to implement plug-in technology for the consumer market? And how do you really balance um, your EV range or your all-electric range compared with the cost of the vehicle and what makes sense for the consumer? And that's a balance point that hasn't been well-defined yet. There's a lot of studies out there about what makes sense from an absolute driving range or um, all-electric driving range opportunity and how many how many percent of the population you can reach. But when these markets go, or when these cars go into the market, is the consumer that has a five mile uh, daily commute really gonna wanna pay for a 40 mile battery pack or not? And is that gonna be the cost balance they're gonna accept as they move forward? So there's a balance point that really needs to happen. Um, and also the configuration of the vehicle itself. At Toyota, we, we believe very strongly in the power split design. We think there's uh, significant cost advantages, uh, even in a plug-in operation. Um, but there are other ways to do it, and as you mentioned before, the Volt is a different way of doing it, and we have to understand which way makes the most sense for the market, and is there a, is there a market out there that would benefit from one or the other technology. Uh, with regards to policy, I think we have to be a little bit careful because plugins represent one of a kind of series of technologies that really enable a sustainable transportation system. Uh, looking at plug-in hybrid vehicles with conventional hybrid vehicles combined with fuel cells and even, in Toyota's opinion, short, shorter range EVs, you can have a very nice holistic solution to, to transportation systems. And uh, when we look at policies, we want to make sure we don't try to choose a winner today. Uh, from a policy point of view, we really should let the market choose the winner. That, 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 that's because this is what I was saying earlier, that the nice thing about the plug-in hybrid is it kind of at the margin, the consumer actually, well, I want to go electric right now, I want to go gasoline. That's very interesting. It's also a good hedging strategy, right? Yeah. So in a sense, what we're doing is we're, we're in a big experiment regarding plugins because presumably we will be collecting and you are collecting real-time data on how people are actually choosing to use the vehicles as opposed to how it might appear in my lecture or, or Sven Biker's lecture or somebody else's lecture, you know, which, which is what we think in theory is going to happen. Everybody understand that subtly. It's very, very, very important. We didn't, we didn't get to do that for the first hundred years of automobiles, and now suddenly everybody's watching what's going on. Okay, let's move to the fuel cell. I'll ask uh, John Tillman, but I have to declare that I had, a, I was a 17-year owner of a VW bus, <laughs> 1987. Incredible car. I learned from that funny book how to actually tune it myself. Uh, because it was, it was what you had. Now, I'm a, a Berkeley hippie from the 60s and 70s, and that's what you had, but it also fit my vibraphone hole, right? which is, was, as you know from a Silmar, is the real <laughs> criteria. I need to have a thing that holds a vibraphone. Uh, how did the company that made the bug and the funky VW bus that hippies camped in wind up being state-of-the-art in electric drive and also, as I hope we get to do next year, something called diesel? What has to happen to the fuel cell side, do you think, to maybe make it nose out the others? Well, the first thing uh, to say right up front is that there is no real technological breakthrough that needs to happen for fuel cells to be on the market. Um, although Dr. Chu of the DOE has said there's um, several miracles, the reality is there are no miracles unless you include infrastructure as being a miracle. Um, <clears throat> the vehicles themselves, they have the range, there are multiple vehicles, including my friend to, to the right here, uh, with m over 400 mile range in a fuel cell vehicle, five minute refueling times. Uh, the reality is though, the cost of the stacks themselves, the durability of them, are challenges for several OEMs. Um, I can't speak for uh, the other two to my right, but there's still challenges that Volkswagen is looking at now. Um, 
but the consumer issue of having to charge for a long period of time uh, really doesn't exist with the fuel cell vehicle. So from that perspective, the consumer would get with a fuel cell vehicle what they're used to now. Five minute refills, three, four, 500 mile ranges. Um, that's not the challenge. The challenge comes in where was the infrastructure going to be placed? Uh, is it something that's available to the consumer as the vehicles roll out? So the real challenge for us isn't so much the technology as it is government policy, a segue into the next section, that will put vehicles or incentivize the infrastructure and the vehicles at the same time. Uh, incentivizing just the vehicles is only part of the problem. You need to incentivize the infrastructure and the placement of appropriate infrastructure uh, to make the vehicle roll out make sense. Uh, you don't want to put hydrogen station at every other station, uh, or hydrogen fueling, should I say, you don't want to put a station even one out of every 10. Uh, you need to place them essentially in California is where the vehicles are going to be rolled out first, potentially and a few other states. But you need to do it in a way that at some point the government will be out of the equation. We can't continue to incentivize this technology or any technology ad infinitum. We need to incentivize early on with uh, rebates, fee baits, uh, another concept, um, tax incentives possibly. But then we have to phase that out. The technology has to stand on its own because right now if you look at our um, GDP uh, compared to the ratio of our national debt, we're getting a high national debt. As a percentage of our GDP, we're at 60%. Going to be at 90% in 10 years, $10 trillion national debt. We can't continue to incentivize these technologies if they're not going to make it in the marketplace by themselves. So the policies have to make sense, but they also have to sunset. We're going to come back to that one after we, because I think the last point is extremely important. If we incentivize everything, we basically make transportation a third to 50% cheaper than it's really costing. We're not only broke in terms of paying for roads and stuff like that, we're broke in general. And we demand more transportation. Some of what is incentivized rebounds as we can afford a bigger hybrid or a bigger fuel cell vehicle because someone else is paying for part of it. So there are concerns there, uh, which, which I want to come back to. I think that, that's a really, really good point and a very fair point coming from an OEM that in a sense you're saying maybe it's time to kind of begin to think about going cold turkey, where it's the, the, lev the, the playing field is levelized. And taking the point earlier, since gasoline is cheap, we, we, we can't really afford to keep lowering the level of the playing field to the price of cheap gasoline. Maybe we have to change it, and we'll come back to that. To hear from the other fuel cell vehicle you get to see, the Clarity, not that the, the vehicle won't talk, but Bob Bienenfeld knows something about these, and why don't you say a few words? Technology and policy. What's the question is what's the what breakthrough do we need? What technology breakthrough do we need? Um, yeah, I, very. It, it depends what the time frame is. Um, you know, uh, the. If, if I'm thinking about um, electricity, then really what I want is uh, uh, some uh, new and better way of making um, uh, nuclear electricity because of the zero, the low carbon footprint. Um, and, um, you know, that, so that's not vehicle related. What do we need on the car? Well, people would say, um, better batteries and better storage for hydrogen. Um, I think that's kind of common sense. Um, really, there's just a lot, a lot of hard work that has to be done to get cost out and reliability up. Um, I have to say I'm not real pessimistic about the uh, infrastructure. I We've worked with a lot of different alternative fuels in the market, and um, I think there's a way to cost-effectively grow infrastructure, whether it's electric or um, hydrogen. Uh, it can grow with the vehicles. Uh, frankly, <clears throat> if you have a lousy car, it's really hard to build infrastructure. Um, if you have a product that people want, um, others will will just climb all over each other to build the infrastructure for those cars. So you got to have great products that people want. The big problem is um, compared to 
gasoline vehicles, every other vehicle has huge problems. Um, they're small kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're, in, they're inferior. And we don't usually, we don't usually go to have a technological revolution based on inferior product. I mean, there is one example, which is um, cell phones, right? You went from a, go from a very clear, reliable um, signal to, to something that's crackling and, you know, you, you, you sometimes get reception, it's not reliable. On the other hand, what you get is something huge, right? You get portability. So how do we create uh, products that give people something that they desperately want? That's the way to change a market. It's regulatory uh, efforts are really uh, haphazard. They have unintended consequences. They tend to stifle some technology and you know inadvertently pick winners. They force you as an OEM to pick low cost solutions that may, maybe are not the best uh, for the long term. So you have to, as an automaker, you have to ignore public policy and do what you think is right. Uh, and then you have to deal with public policy um, because it's invariably um, messy and, and problematic. Um, but really, the, the question that you have to be thinking about is, how do we make something that people want? And, uh, and, 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 the, and there are very few people who say, uh, yeah, what I want is something that's not petroleum-based. Or, or people who say, what I really want is something that's not contributing to CO, you know, bad CO2. Typical, typical gasoline car is putting a pound of CO2 into the atmosphere every mile you drive. A pound. That's a lot, a lot of CO2. If you value that, that's great, but how, do we, how are we gonna get people to value it? It's very difficult. Uh, lately what I've been thinking about is, um, is losing weight. <laughs> how, do you, how do you lose weight? You know, uh, the simple thing is you, you eat uh, 250 or 300 fewer calories a day. But making a small change is sometimes really hard. Sometimes what you have to do is go on a diet and just say, okay, I'm not going to eat all this. I'm going to eat different foods or I'm going to have a different regimen. And we all know how successful that is. I mean, you, you know, you, you need to, uh, you have to think about what motivates people. And, uh, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity for uh, creative thinkers to address this, uh, this area. And I'm not sure it's been well addressed by anybody. I think the theme that I gather there is it, has, it isn't just a question of this fuel versus that fuel, but a better product. Absolutely. Some of us heard Larry Burns, formerly GM, seven years ago at GM, talk about the, what did they call it, the high? high yeah, this, it was going to be a, a, a fuel high cell motion. car. High motion. High, high wire. High motion. High, motion. high wire. High wire. High wire. High wire. Yeah. And his point was, and you can take it with a grain of salt or, or, a, or a lithium hydride molecule, whatever you like, was that in the end, electric drive simply may be better drive. So we are talking about operating system. We're not just talking about the black box versus, uh, and all you do is get in, you step on the same accelerator. But I think that the, one of the things that I've learned from practicing with the Prius and practicing with the Honda I borrowed and practicing with the Ford Milan was, you still have to learn how to drive it somewhat differently. Uh, how many of you have Nokia phones? I'm sorry. How many of you old enough you remember when there were two ways hand calculators worked? Right? There was one plus one equals two, or one enter two plus. Reverse Polish logic, it's called. Well, to me, the Nokia and the, and the Motorola or the iPhone are like that. I can't use Nokia. And so there's an issue here is all these newfangled cars, they may work better in a different operating system. And that's going to be one of the things that probably affects our perception as to whether it's really a better ride. Right? When I, the Ford P1000, I couldn't tell what was under the hood. I just knew it, as both of you pointed out, it's the most like a fueled car. So it has the, the fewest dif differences. And that may be a strong advantage compared to a much more, uh, a battery feel. On the other hand, nothing accelerates like the Tesla, right? 
So there are all these different things, and it comes down to attributes and people learning. Now, I asked Brett Williams to join us uh, because not just because he works in the, in the same uh, building under the seminar, seminary that I do in Berkeley, but because he's been involved a little with the program to actually give real life people Toyotas of different, different kinds of Toyotas uh, and see how they, they learn how to use them. And every day you look up from your, my office and there's a Highlander fuel cell vehicle and then there's a, one day his boss brought by uh, one of the plug-in Toyota hy hybrids. So there's a whole group of different ways, different operating systems, even from the same manufacturer, often under the same platform. So what do you think, Brett? What's, what has to change? Is it policy, is it technology, or is it people? Um, well, let me start. I'll take uh, academic privilege here, since I'm at a university, and, and just say a little bit more than you said about to frame the problem. In other words, to state my biases or to sort of tell you where I'm coming from and what I can speak to. And forgive me, I'm juggling two events this, this morning, so if I start talking about battery second life or V to G or something, just shock me and I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> but essentially what UC Berkeley has started with Toyota, and we hope you know, to do more and more of in some way, shape, or form over time, is we're placing with households for one month each. First, they get a Prius as a control. Second, they get a plug-in Prius. And third, they get a fuel cell vehicle. In this case, it's a fuel cell Highlander. And so we have some preliminary analysis based on data that we're slowly collecting on those, those placements. Now, none of this you could generalize. You'd have to all take it with a grain of lithium ion salt. Um, but I can certainly speak a little bit today about sort of vehicle choice lessons from that project. And I can speak a little bit about the technology individually. Um, the first thing to say is kind of to echo some of what, what Honda was saying too is, again, this is small focus groups. Our N is not stati statistically significant. But I think it's, it's common themes that help us frame the way we're thinking. The first is, you know, sort of why uh, are they concerned about these vehicles? It's high upfront costs. That's a whole conversation, whether it's battery costs or fuel cell costs. Why do they want these vehicles? It tends to be geopolitical slightly above climate change, and again, this was a year or so ago, and things are changing over time. Um, if you ask them hypothetically before they know anything about the cars, their ultimate eco car vision currently still lags as the fuel cell vehicle. So better environmental performance in their mind over a battery electric vehicle. Now, they all surprisingly tended to know what fuel cell vehicles were and what full battery vehicles were. They had a surprisingly little knowledge about plug-in hybrids. And there we experience something that's very important when you think about these vehicle choice models, which is preference instability. You tell them a little bit about the plug-in hybrid, and all of a sudden it rises to the top. It's not their ultimate solution, but it's something they could see their product evolving into, a hybrid and then into a plug-in hybrid. And they actually choose based on, you lose them very quickly if you, if, you know, I'm talking generalized large markets, not a different business approaches, which we would should talk about more too, which is the challenge of strategic niche marketing, sort of scaling up the Teslas and scaling down the OEMs in terms of their ability to provide this diverse portfolio of options that, you know, uh, Justin was saying would be the ideal way to provide transportation services. So um, let's see, where was I? So, Stanford. right, well, I'm in Stanford. Thank you. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, battery second life, no. Uh, the first thing is this preference instability, which is they learn a little bit about the product, their preferences are gonna change dramatically. So the plug-in hybrid rise, rose above the fuel cell in terms of what they theoretically wanted. Now after they drove these vehicles, what they found was different. And keep in mind, this is confounded because they're driving a Prius. Now this is our control, and what we're finding already is for some people, for many people, just getting them in the Prius provides an aha moment. Not the ideal control, but for them, that's, that's the major step. So a lot of these subsequent steps into alternative fuels is an even bigger leap that they may you know, think of later. The second thing to say is that they tended to think that and enjoy driving the fuel cell vehicle more than the other cars. We don't have a pure battery electric car, but they felt safer, and this is of course confounded with the fact that it's an SUV, but that is part of the equation. If a fuel cell can provide a longer range in an SUV, then there you are, you know, the historical trajectory of the way people buy cars is that's gonna be valued in the marketplace. And you know, if I want 
uh, battery electric vehicle for myself, I have to acknowledge as a researcher sort of what these messages that we're learning with a, you know, a year lead time, lag time and these things changing over time, but that's actually the point. It's very difficult to use a discrete choice model or something to predict car behavior the more different the vehicle is from what they know. And those models are dependent on uh, um, preference stability, so you actually violate some of the premises of those models. The last thing I'll, I'll just try to throw together is, so that's kind of vehicle choice, just sort of early reactions. The next thing is this kind of vehicle design, and I think we've talked about it a little bit, is like in a plug-in hybrid, for example, how big is the battery? Well, our initial Toyota plug-in Prius is a very small battery. It's essentially a double nickel metal hydride battery. The car you'll see today, I think, is already, a, is it a lithium ion? And an, I don't know, can you say how many kilowatt hours of battery it is? Okay. It's larger than the one we've been using. Right, you can Google it. Um, so in some ways, this result is already passe, but what we found with these initial vehicles is that there is a point at which people decide, oh, yes, I want the plug-in hybrid to improve my fuel economy, which seems to be where their eye is because that's what they understand. It's not gas receipts, it's fuel economy. Oh, that's an improvement. But it's got to improve enough that it's worth plugging it in. It's, everybody found it very easy to plug in, but if it was a small incremental increase, they wouldn't plug it in. Now, it doesn't take you very much battery to suddenly make that worth it to a lot of people. And these are all sort of intuitive summaries of what I understand of the data. So caveat, caveat, caveat. So there's this question then between upfront costs, and this is where I'll end it, and what you can provide in terms of environmental performance. And so one of the things we're also doing at TSRC is trying to figure out ways to reduce, hide, or otherwise buffer the consumer from high upfront costs. And so that gets you into the simplest thing being a lease or a term payment as opposed to an upfront cost. The fancy way of doing that is to provide all kinds of other values that hopefully will, will make that a softer picture. Um, some of the technologies, of course, batteries for the battery cars, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure for fuel cell vehicles. Again, the people like the way the cars drive already, very smooth acceleration all the way up to highway uh, speeds. Um, and there is a lot of literature on sort of what's enough infrastructure. And some of the lessons you should take away from infrastructure is that it doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of infrastructure, but the consumers want to perceive that it's increasing. In other words, it's a winner, it's on the, it's on the increase. Um, the second thing is there's some analysis on sort of the costs of if it's less dense than, say, 10% of what you're use, uh, used to, you're probably going to feel those costs in terms of having to drive out of your way and that sort of thing. Now, having said all of that, I think you're seeing most of the placements of these vehicles, the fuel cell vehicles, are being targeted towards fleets or infrastructure-centric placements, and we had to do that in our case, too, whereas the, ba the battery-type vehicles are being placed in a, in a different way, you know, based on the ability to home recharge or that sort of thing. Everybody likes fueling at home. Even though it's a little bit of a hassle, they just don't like going to the gasoline stations. And so those are some initial thoughts. I hope it's really more of a discussion of a pol or strategy as opposed to policy, but I hope that's useful as well. Thank you. At one point I'll make, I had a friend in Washington, D.C. who had home charging for her Honda CNG vehicle. And I don't know how they deal with gas fuel taxes, but the point was that that's an interesting point made is that you can charge it at home. And that is the advantage of the hot air car. One of them is you pump the air in yourself, okay? So to some people, maybe that's a value we hadn't thought about. You can take care of it all at home, right? <laughs> Several of Bob's colleagues helped me with the initial analysis of the uh, compressed air car. For a hot air car, you have to go to con continually go to conferences, which is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I know, I know. And I, we're going to try to turn the heat down in here. Okay, we, I want to. We want to. We want to have interaction now. We want to have questions. Questions, not yet statements. There's always time for statements. But do it. Does anybody want to ask any very specific technical questions for anyone? Granted, they may not be able to answer all of them. But let's take questions. Try to go to the mic and please identify yourself. Second one you want to say. Yes, uh, Brian von Hersen from the Climate Foundation. So I read up on the CNG car from Honda a little bit, and it seemed like there were a number of users that were more of a, a big fans of this uh, Honda CNG vehicle than Honda itself. Uh, I was wondering if Bob could comment on this and, and talk about where that's going. CNG is compressed natural gas for those. Sure, that... sure. Um, so natural gas is a great fuel. It's ubiquitous. It's, uh, it's uh, in the United States. It's piped to most of the homes and offices. Um, it is, it's, so it's domestic, it's good for energy security. From a CO2 viewpoint, it's a 25% reduction. 
uh, in CO2, just apples to apples, a Civic, a Civic CNG car versus a Civic gasoline car. Uh, you can refuel at home. It's, it's great. We, we love the car. Um, the problem is um, the regulatory direction is to get to 80% reduction. 80% reduction in tons, which really means 90% reduction in intensity. So what that means is because the population is going to double, if you have a 90% reduction, right, that you're at the 10% level, the population doubles or the VMT doubles, then you're at 20%. So a 25% reduction is really good, but doesn't get you there. So how do you look, how, how many, and then, and then the next question is, how many revolutions can we go through and how quickly? So let's say it takes 15, 20 years to get a customers interested in a technology. Um, we've had hybrids in the market for, um, for 10 years, and they're 3% of the U.S. market, and half that is with one company, one product that has some interesting you know, social, political um, attributes that others don't. So um, do we put the effort to get a CNG revolution and then a plug-in, you know, a, and then a, hy a hybrid and then a plug-in hybrid? How, how much time do we have? If you look at the long-term goal, you want to be there in 2050 and you have to work backwards, you need, you know, 15 years to turn over the fleet and then you need uh, some development time and you've got to get technology. So is CNG the right way to go? It's a big question. Is that it? I hope that answers. Very good. Uh, I, let's point out too that, uh, that I'm not an oil geologist. I did work for a small company called Shell International once. But the U.S. probably is in better shape on natural gas supply than on oil supply. And for a given amount of money, it's easier to make clean burning natural gas and vehicle, natural gas vehicles than, than gasoline vehicles. It's just a simpler molecule. So it did, it, 20 years ago, when, the, when the, the driving concern was clean air, CNG was very attractive. And one of the reasons why many bus fleets around the world, including in countries that do not have a lot of natural gas, went to compressed natural gas was because it just got rid of a whole lot of problems that a state-owned owned oil company was not going to deal with for 10 or 20 years. But 20 years hence, when, the, when, 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 when clean air is not nearly as critical a problem because of what we've done to oil, it, maybe that's one of the reasons why CNG, which had an early start, lost its edge. Next question. So uh, a couple questions Your since name? you made me wait so long. Um, number one to Toyota. Uh, it seems like you've had a significant advantage in the marketplace with an electric electric technology uh, with the Prius. Um, as I understand it, you've uh, come out with a fuel cell car. I was wondering what the epiphany was there. That's the first question. The second question is, I have not heard it from anyone today um, talk about externality costs of, of petroleum and fossil fuel and was wondering if we could get some commentary on, on that to be the evening up of moving into these technologies. Thank you. Okay, regarding the, um, the Toyota vehicle and, is this thing working? There we go. Uh, regarding the Toyota, the vehicles and our advanced transportation system, I, I'm uh, responsible for the development of our advanced powertrains here in North America, which includes fuel cells, hy um, advanced hybrids, uh, plug-in hybrids, electric vehicles and whatnot. So um, just to give a little bit of history, we've been working on fuel cell technology since the early 90s. So we've always had um, a kind of love for that technology. And it wasn't until recently where we actually were able to um, really get past some of the big technical hurdles have we started making more noise about um, fuel cell technology. Uh, basically what you're seeing is the, co the confidence, our confidence in that technology as a, playing a role in the future getting much stronger. And, and that's why um, you're seeing it more now. It's not that we made a switch. Uh, we actually think that um, there's gonna be a, a marriage of these technologies moving forward. We think. Um, some applications, fuel cells work very well, and some applications, um, short-range commuter cars, uh, there's no reason not to go EV in, some, in that type of application. But in some cases, the consumer can't afford to have two cars, and maybe they need one, and in that case, a plug-in could offer them the benefit of electric vehicle as well as giving them the range they need. So they're really, from our perspective, it's kind of a marriage. One of the things I've, I've said to the class was, I'm, the more papers we get on precisely these kinds of issues, one of our students is doing certain kind of modeling, the more interesting it gets, because there's so many new ideas that come out of this idea that maybe 
one vehicle really can be used with two operating systems, if, if you take my, my paradigm. Very good. Hi, I'm Ted Hesser. Um, I was wondering if the panel could talk a little bit about ancillary services provided by plug-in electric vehicles. Brett, this might bring you back to the other conference you were at. You should have been there this morning. Um, yeah, and just what kind of costs that might add or detract from um, possible plug-in electric vehicles and how that might make it more attractive for an individual to buy into it, what some of the problems might be with cycle life and maybe liability from a battery manufacturing standpoint. Right, so just to sort of set the stage for you, those of you that may not know precisely what he's talking about is there's this investigation of, and I'll, I'll just say the way I'm coming at it. So if batteries have high initial costs, what are the ways you can get that down? There's volume, there's sharing applications across the same product, there's uh, doing a small plug-in hybrid battery versus a large one, there's all these different things. The other way to, to do that is for that battery to provide value other than driving you from A to B. Now, as, as much as I might be, as an academic, very interested in, in vehicle-to-grid, for example, power, or I called it more generally mobile electricity or, you know, providing backup power, that sort of thing, um, I have to keep in mind that the, the automakers are trying to squeeze that battery bubble. They're trying to keep costs down without safety or durability or performance going out the window. And so they, I think... The average automaker, I'm not talking about any individual or any company, would just as soon probably leave that to the future once they've got some nice commercialized products that they have full liability control over all this sort of thing, full degradation. They know what it's going to be used. They're giving warranties on odometers, not sort of the kilowatts in and out of that battery. Having said that, there's a lot of investigation on what those sort of values might be. The one that's most popularly explored because it started in the literature first was using a form of energy storage to provide grid regulation services. This is a behind the scenes market that the Cal ISO has to manage constantly supply and demand in the electric grid. Operator. Right, California in independent system operators kind of manages the California grid as opposed to an individual utility. They set these markets behind the scenes to make sure that supply and demand match up on a minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day basis. And so one of these is called regulation and batteries are actually very good at supplying this service. If you've already paid for the battery for the car, could you get some value out of it without undue uh, degradation and so forth? Where our research has actually gone is towards intentionally retiring the, vehicle, the battery out of the vehicle, not battery swapping, but just once, and then using what's called battery second life. So providing those same grid services, but with a stationary appliance rather than in the vehicle, you kind of separate the uh, automaker anxiety out of the picture. That's not to say you couldn't do both. In theory, it's just the way that the questions are being asked for, of us by funders and that sort of thing. So we're looking at providing those values. And the, the trade-offs are interesting because the bigger the battery, the more services you can contract for. But the, the higher the cost of the infrastructure, uh, for example, the, you know, the wires being the rate-limiting step. Um, so these profits, you know, whether it's grid regulations, um, spinning reserves or whatever, uh, can range from being slightly unprofitable to being, you know, a couple hundred dollars per year profits versus being a couple thousand dollars per year profits. But that depends on so many um, different uh, assumptions that let's, let's talk about it more in, in, in the future. But keep in mind that there's not just the competition to providing these services currently is power plants. The next thing you have to think about is people just buying new batteries to do it in battery farms. Then you think about um, retired batteries getting some sort of residual value out of the battery so that maybe the, the car or the battery lease in the first place might be a little bit less if you can establish that after five years of driving it will have value in a secondary market or using it you know, for various things that you might want to do as an individual living a lifestyle or that the grid might pay you to do when it's on board the vehicle. So that's just kind of the space of exploration. Lots of interesting um, uh, points there. And the last thing I'll say that go, gets back to policy and the unanswered question about externalities. We're the Transportation Sustainability Research Center. That's kind of inherent in everything we do, but we often don't talk about it anymore because we're thinking about business models. One of the important things is, questions that we're asking right now is, is an electron used as fuel, is e-fuel different than a, a regular electron in terms of the value it provides society? And therefore, is the regulatory system that might regulate e-fuel different than traditional electricity. And one of the reasons you might do that is you have to track these e-fuel electrons anyway because you got to assign carbon credits in California to whoever displaced the gasoline. 
You've also got to come up with a mechanism that you can tax e-fuel to make up for lost road taxes. That, second term the second paper. Right. So, I mean, we're definitely simpatico on that point. So you're going to be keeping track of these anyway. So, for example, that's one thing why you might want to pay attention to, even if you're not interested in V to G, you might be interested in smart charging or the way we're keeping track of um, electrons that provide fuel as these sort of systems converge over time. We can talk more about it later, and that was a pretty long answer. But It's worth saying that a colleague of ours, Willard Kempton, anthropologist, 12 years ago wrote a paper saying, why can't we use fuel cell vehicles when we're not using them? They're 80, 90 kilowatt generators. Why can't we feed power into the grid with them? And I guess it didn't really, it didn't really take hold. But his point was automobiles are used to move us between one and one and a half hours a day. The rest of the time they're sitting there. And his point was a fuel cell is a great generator of electricity no matter where it is, as long as it can plug that, what it generates, uh, into something. And so this whole idea that maybe we, we go beyond transportation uh, into integrating mobile sources into the rest of our lives when they're stationary sources is, is not, ju not that new and maybe really deserves a lot of merit. Similarly, the idea that you charge your batteries at night because you have a smart meter when the electric grid has lots of extra capacity, uh, the whole idea there is then you don't need to build a lot of power plants or a lot of extra uh, transmission capacity to get, to, get, to get electric vehicles charged up, and then the extra cost to society are really only the energy burned, not capacity and power plants. And that's different from if people all want to charge their vehicles at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, a summer day, when California is just about maxed out, and we're buying some coal-fired electricity from the Northwest or, or from, uh, from, from Four Corners. So there are all kinds of interesting issues you have to come to when you realize that because you don't tend to store a lot of electricity, you're suddenly integrating yourself one way or another more into the rest of the system. And all the, elect the, the elasticity issues, uh, the, uh, sorry, the externality issues, and therefore a whole extra thing of public policy that these poor guys based in Sacramento hadn't thought they had to worry about becomes important. Next question. Hi, this is Kate Messmer. I do investor relations for a public auto retailer as well as an auto parts company. Um, my question is related to one part I think that we haven't talked about in terms of the consumer adoption of these vehicles is both the cost and access to repair. Um, I know that Tesla has, has introduced a program where they will you know, basically give door-to-door -door service, although that's cost prohibitive, I would imagine, for some people until they get enough dealerships out there. So I guess I'm curious in how you guys are, are approaching that problem as we look a little bit further down the life cycle of the vehicle. I mean, because of the advanced technology of a lot of these vehicles, I would imagine a lot of the work will have to be done at the dealership rather than at your you know, local auto repair shop. And so are you guys contemplating you know, maybe longer warranties for these vehicles or ways that would help consumers with the cost of that? <laughs> made it sound very expensive. Um, so, so a few points on, on service. Uh, service infrastructure, like charge infrastructure or other infrastructures, um, you don't need as much as you think you do. So as long as you have a, a, an intelligent network of service locations, um, offering a mobile service, which is what we do today, we have the Tesla Rangers, as we call them, come out to your, to your place of work or to, uh, to your home, um, when the cars don't break down very much, like electric cars, it's not all that expensive to send someone out and, and, and fix something under warranty because it doesn't happen maybe as frequently um, because of you know, less moving parts and whatnot. Um, so it, it's true, you need, you need an infrastructure set up, but um, with, with seven locations right now, service locations, we're, we're pretty well established uh, to service those vehicles. So uh, it, yeah, the, your local mom and pop can't take care of it, but we'll take care of it with no problem. You know, if I may also respond, uh, as an electric bicycle maker, I often fall into this advocacy role, but in terms of deploying a technology and hearing the auto representatives talk about the challenges, what's exciting about the electric bicycle is we don't have any of these challenges. The exciting part is that largely if we can use this technology today, no impediments, uh, in terms of policy limitations, technology limitations, and to answer your question about diagnostics and service and after-sale care, we were able to develop a remote diagnostics tool such that we include a thumb drive with every owner's manual kit. And the thumb drive has an app running, and should your bike ever 
stop operating. You literally plug it into a PC or a Mac, and it reaches a Pi technician, and we can literally look at your the bike, at least the electronic side of the bike, and we can discern whether or not there's a battery problem or a controller problem and so forth, and we can literally deploy or ship the technology next day. Um, so I think what's exciting potentially about the bicycle and as an adjunct, the electric bicycle is when we start talking about carbon you know, footprint and so forth, wow, you just get on a bicycle and you solve the problem. So the, the ultimate equation from our perspective is, and, and it's one where as soon as you downscale the vehicle such that the human being can contribute to some of the mode of energy, wow, you solve enormous problems. So um, I think that the electric bicycle, one of the reasons why we're seeing numbers that we are now is that it's become a very, it's become clear to consumers that, that they can make and manifest change without having to wait for policy or the next generation of lithium or you know, a fuel cell infrastructure. It's just something you can do right now. On the, um, <clears throat> I think people forget that that um, uh, internal combustion engine uh, technology is not standing still. So um, <clears throat> you, f <clears throat> some of the advances that have taken place are um, very often a technician is plugging in um, a car to a PGM tester or now directly into a. Um, into a network that's connected to the OEM that pushes out diagnostics as well as repair instructions right at the moment. So it's, it's trained as you need to repair. Um, so uh, it, this is technology that's not unique to EVs or fuel cells. Um, I think everybody's building things that are going to be uh, repairable in the field where you can broadcast uh, over satellite uh, um, uh, uh, satellite uh, networks, uh, software upgrades. I mean, that, that's just happening. So I, I don't see the new technology as any particularly interesting challenge compared to the existing technology. Yeah, and, and actually, Tesla's doing that today, and uh, some other manufacturers are as well. So um, the the Roadster uh, today can be rem diagnostic uh, diagnostics can be run remotely through wireless networks and uh, repairs can be made if necessary. Yeah, and just to kind of add to that, I think um, we, we had this kind of very similar problem. Whoa. <laughs> we had kind of a very similar problem when we uh, uh, put the Prius out early um, uh, many years ago, and a lot of questions we got, well, how are people going to service it? It's so different from a conventional car. And uh, the reality is that there is some different um, techniques that you need to use to diagnose the cars. We try to make it use the same tools that uh, are in the conventional dealership today so that it's not a whole new learning experience. But there are some things you need to be aware of because it is high voltage and things. And so what we've always done is we have our Toyota University where we train our dealer mechanics. And, and we, we don't live under the delusion that there'll be dealer, dealer mechanics forever because most of them will go, make, um, will go work in the private uh, auto repair market. And through that kind of normal um, kind of process, uh, slowly the market gets you know, very well educated on hybrid technology and how to service it. I think um, as we move forward with these advanced technologies, you'll see kind of the same kind of pathway. Before we go to the next question, I think an issue that's arisen when I listened to you, these answers was whether the combination of a surge in popularity of electric bikes and the fact that the PHEV allows you to sort of take both roads, might that not push us towards greater familiarity with true electric drive and in a sense, leave the fuel cell vehicle where there's kind of, there's no intermediate step the way there seems to be with battery electric. Yeah, I, I think that's, there's a lot of people who say, yeah, let's, let's just get people familiar with, with uh, battery uh, technology and that uh, um, plug-in hybrids are the pathway towards battery electrics. And uh, could be, I, I, I think that um, consumers are endlessly uh, sur surprising. Um, I in many ways, we're, we're all happy to talk about technology, but nobody wants to talk about the customer because nobody understands the customer. <laughs> you know, you, you, uh, you see what, what you're doing, what the competitors are doing, you find something that looks like a trend, you try to get out in front of it and build a lot of those products. Um, I, f from our viewpoint, I mean, one of the things that Honda said um, consistently is that um, if you look at social issues, the simplest, cheapest, most effective thing we can do for the near term 
think of near term as you know, 10 to 15 years, is move towards hybridization. All the other technologies are great for the long term. It takes a long time. People get excited about that technology. But we're at 3% uh, penetration of uh, hybrids in the new vehicle market, and much, much lower when you think of the rolling stock. So uh, that transition is hugely important. And if we don't make that leap, then all the other leaps are going to be uh, um, even more challenging. And um, if, you think that, uh, if you think that automobiles change slowly, um, please think about the grid. The grid changes very, very slowly. We're on the order of every four or five years, and they're on the order of every 20 or 30 years. So um, it's interesting. The, the uh, Highlander fuel cell is hybridized. The one that, is the Clarity hybridized? The Clarity is, is uh, you mean like a plug-in? Hybrid? No, hybridized in the sense that oh, it's yes. got... Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. You've got regenerative braking. Okay, great, yeah. yeah. So in a sense, we were getting, even on the fuel cell side, and what about the VW? Yeah, so on the fuel cell side, we're also, there really is a strong message here then, that, there, that the relationships among these technologies are, are very, very, very close. So maybe it was a mistake of me to think that the fuel cell was way out there because it, it's all kind of, I mean, that, that must, what must make it easier is that all of these have so many, so, are so related through electronics, these guys, electric drive, that maybe the fuel cell is closer to the others than I had imagined. One of the things people forget is that the fuel cell, we, we tend to put fuel cell vehicle as the moniker. It's actually fuel cell electric vehicle. They are, they have FCEV. electric, FCEV. Yeah. They have a fuel cell as their uh, source of electricity, but, and they have a battery for uh, regenerative braking and for offline acceleration potentially. But um, they are very similar to a battery electric vehicle. The only difference being they have a fuel cell in place of a battery system to provide the energy on demand versus a stored energy. I mean, there are other differences, but essentially though, when we were doing our fuel cell program, we learned a great deal that applied directly to the battery electric and the hybrid electric vehicle programs. So it, we're, we're learning, it, things we're doing with fuel cell vehicles, we're directly applying, and I presume the other manufacturers are the exact same thing, being directly applied to the technology of, uh, other than fuel cell. So, so if we all get more familiar with battery drive because of e-bikes, that either is a step towards the other kind, it, it certainly helps for transportation, but it may also be a step towards learning about electric drive with, uh, as Jonathan showed in his slide earlier, an order of magnitude less investment, or even two orders of magnitude. We're not talking about a lot of money on the table to learn how to use a device that is hybrid, foot, or electricity. Yes, uh, Brian Von Herzen from Climate Foundation. Question for Marcus Hayes. I heard that a three-wheeled enclosed vehicle in some states, perhaps California, would be considered to be a bike rather than a car. Uh, how does this change policy, and, and how do you see that affecting adoption of e-bikes as we go forward? Well, I believe the, uh, the question is, when these vehicles start becoming more common, what happens to the human power cyclist on the bike path and bike lane? And hopefully through uh, Ray LaHood's uh, policy shift, there will be more attention paid to expanding those bike lanes. But the direct answer is... Um, California law describes an electric bike as being anything that uh, limits speed at 20 miles per hour, essentially, and it can have three or four or two wheels. It doesn't really matter. So as long as it's narrow enough to fit in a bike lane, presumably it's uh, deployable. Yeah, I should have been more precise that it's really the um, motorcycle versus car distinction with respect to licensing and, and all the regulations and all the rest of it. If it's a motorcycle instead of a car, does that change the burden in, in developing these new vehicles for the United States market? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it is considered a motorcycle, a three-wheeled enclosed vehicle that, that travels it up, up to highway speeds. Um, and it does change the burden. You don't have to crash test them, for example. And you don't have to safety test them in many respects, which reduces the burden but also increases the, the risk and, and consumer perceptions. And, I mean, a well, motorcycle is something that's very clear to people. Once you enclose it, they, um, I think consumers expect vehicle car level safety and they're not going to get it, which is um, sort of a direction, again, that, that Tesla has taken that's maybe different than a number of the other electric vehicle manufacturers is 
fully safety tested, fully crash tested, et cetera, like any other car. And so if, uh, if I may, you know, in the process of designing a vehicle, a three, four, or otherwise, there's you know, back to the, the challenge of understanding what the consumer wants. It's fairly clear that consumers don't really want three-wheel highway legal vehicles. There hasn't really been a successful three-wheeler yet. But back to the strategy of downscaling, if you can uh, make a vehicle of a scale and weight that's appropriate to invite some human contribution for motive energy, all sorts of exciting things start to happen. And, and much of what we're talking about, there are surpluses that start to occur when you downscale that vehicle. So in California, for example, we have the benefit of some policy, forward-looking policy, where uh, an electric bike, two-wheel or three, uh, presuming it doesn't exceed 30 miles per hour, requires a car license and not a motorcycle license, for example. And then electric bikes, specifically, if capped at 20, uh, don't require any licensing at all. One comment from a lifelong cyclist, the fact that they could go a lot faster than everybody else who was streaming at the same, the same constant speed. So it's, it's also why I was joking about, the, about the, uh, the segue earlier. It's not that it isn't all right, that they're, they're perfectly safe, but when you get large streams of cyclists and great variation in cycle speed, then you start to have problems. And so I think the point that Marcus made is that we, ha we can make more space for two-wheeled vehicles in general. So at the worst, they're just competing with themselves and not also with cars. I used to cycle home to North Berkeley on Shattuck Avenue, which is, you know, the gourmet ghetto. You can cycle by several coffee places and snort in the air enough, uh, enough uh, cappuccino at night have to stop and buy one. And my boss, Elizabeth Deacon, who is one of the great transport gurus of the country, almost hit me by accident. She said, why are you driving on Shattuck when we have a bike boulevard a block west, Milvey Avenue, two blocks west? And she's right. So we have these really nice uh, places where there's lots of room for two-wheeled vehicles, and a lot of them are barred to cars in one direction. So it isn't that hard to reorganize road space without the, the automobilist thinking that he or she is losing a lot and actually open up a lot more space to slower speed vehicles. But we still have the danger of a great variation in speed among the slower speed vehicles. And that, again, might, might also be another kind of operating system shift, shifting from uh, a system of huffing and puffing, as I've always done, to where uh, the one time I tried this on a, on a motorbike, it's incredible. You just do this, and boom, you really go. So there's, there's a, a lot of learning to be done on the part of us with two wheels to be able to go to motorized two wheels. But I think most urban areas in the U.S. have the space for this. That's, that's the luxury that we have. We get room for this, because we've got, we got wide streets in neighborhoods of low density. Other question? I'm Steve Williams. I, uh, I came here in a 2010 Prius that I borrowed that had its software, its brake software, updated last week. Not over the satellite, yeah, here, you, can you, but can at I the dealership. The yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, but my, my daily driver is a 1984 Volkswagen van, so, but I don't think I'm a hippie, so I, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, Zach Edson from Tesla seemed to put a lot of emphasis on the need for policy change around gasoline pricing. And that made me think of uh, articles in the local papers here last week from the news that Caltrain may be shutting down because they can't get the ridership. They, they don't get enough support, enough uh, uh, financial support from the taxes that, that we're already paying. And the, the, the story that I read said, well, there's just not a political will, even here in the Bay Area, one of the most progressive areas, to add a gasoline tax to support public transit. So how realistic is it really to think that Americans as a whole are ever going to pay what gas, what the true cost of gasoline in order to make these electric vehicles uh, uh, more competitive? Um, so yeah, I emphasized policy and didn't really talk about technology, which is, which is sort of interesting because Tesla is such a technology company. Um, but the reason I didn't emphasize technology is because it's, it's already here today and we have it and we're in production and there's over a thousand cars on the road. So from a technology standpoint, there's really very little that needs to be done to have cars today. Um, it's not a 10 or 15 year time frame. Now, there can be improvements obviously made in, in the cost of energy storage and so forth, so it can improve. Um, the realistic, um, how realistic is, is uh, a, a gas tax? I think it takes one or two events to get people to um, be more receptive to it. And when I say events, it could be 
um, what's what's going to happen with Iran, for example, or what's going to happen with some some other countries? Um, I, I think there are situations where, both politically and from a, con, a consumer level, um, we will all start to understand the tr again the true cost of of our consumption. And when you start to say there's a tax and there's a technology alternative today, because in the past if you said gas tax, that just means less less driving, less usage. Um, but if you have the public infrastructure alternatives or um, a vehicle alternative that doesn't use one of those petroleum products, then, then it starts to become more and more acceptable. So, so uh, uh, you, you know, in general, it is, it is um, any tax is difficult to, to pass and difficult to discuss, especially when it affects us as individuals. But it's not, it's not a tax that is forced upon everyone across the board. It's, it's forced based on usage. And usage patterns can evolve so that you don't have to, you know, you don't have to pay the, the level of tax that you might pay today. So, um, yeah, I think a couple of events are probably required. But um, instead of talking about some of the more complex programs, rebates, fee baits, et cetera, it starts to sound like IRS tax code. And whereas one, one action can take care of, of, of the same, uh, you know, this, the, the same expected behaviors, you can take the one action instead of multiple. What, one comment from the chair here. 30 years ago, almost all of our highway and transport costs came out of the gasoline tax. Anybody want to guess what percentage nationally and, 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 and state together, what percentage of the cost of our ground transport system comes from the gasoline taxes and diesel taxes today? Almost, 40. So some of it comes from sales taxes. If you bought a Starbucks today, you paid for a little of the road. And three, count them three, bipartisan national commissions have all pled, you know. And it may be that the event we're talking about is potholes. Sadly, bridges collapsing. These aren't doomsday scenarios. We're in trouble everywhere. And the question is how to do this by making the user pay. Uh, Without naming parties, both parties take out violins and suddenly have this enormous outpouring for the poor, who actually don't drive. But it's suddenly enormous sympathy for the poor, okay? And one party figures out how to hide it, and the other party says take it out of Medicare or something else. And you can decide which party does which. But you get my point. Uh, the, 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 what was got, gotten across is correct. It's very difficult. Something's got to give, and no one knows what's going to give. But what some of us believe is that the CO2 and fuel aside, there are bigger problems in transport that aren't addressed that are now stuck on as, if you will, externalities or unpaid costs. So it can't keep going that way. I, I want to make one point. Oh, okay, I, I think ahead. we have to be very careful, though, in talking about an event which drives up the price of a barrel of oil. That's the basic commodity price. The tax you pay isn't relative percentage of, of the gallon of gas you pay. The, tax you pay federal and state is fixed. So if you drive, if the price of a gallon of gas is driven up by some event in Kuwait or, or, or in Saudi Arabia or some other issue, that affects the price of a barrel of oil and ultimately a gallon of gas. It does not affect directly the taxes on that gas. So it's incorrect to say that an event will change the tax base. It won't. No, I think you misunderstood the and point, I, though. The point is that you could get political support for the tax based on an event. Not that it's just going to happen automatically. So to your point, it may be potholes are the event. It may be taking out another road bond to support freeway infrastructure. Um, I use the geopolitical example, but it's not, I'm not talking about the price of the, the barrel. So. But the, the point, though, about driving, about you getting the tax base increased, that will require not an event of the type that I misunderstood your point on, but that will require, you know, things getting so bad, bridges, roads, that people say we need to fix these. And we will need to then approve an increase in the tax base for that. Um, but the other point we have to make, though, is that if we do shift to vehicle electrification, the government's not just going to let it go by and say we're not going to tax electric, electricity going to vehicles. They're going to figure a way through uh, the DMV or other. They're going to ask you at the beginning of the year how many miles to drive this year. Okay, 1,000. When you come back next year, how many drive now? Oh, I have 10,000 on my car. They're going to figure a way to tax the miles you've driven because they haven't taxed the electricity going into your car. It's roughly three cents a mile is what we pay today. And it probably should be on everything. But the point is, the point is that the combination of 
the fact that we've been buying more efficient vehicles and we're driving them less, and a small fraction of them are, ex are bought using tax-exempt fuels means that highway revenues uh, are, 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 are lower, lower as a percentage of how many miles we drive than they've been in a long, long time. So that's why we we're kind of in deep doo-doo in a whole lot of different ways. We, we, there will be a pepper fogger if we don't end at 320 promptly. So quick questions and then we'll wind up. Uh, sure. Um, my name is Dan Strickland. I'm a PhD student in mechanical engineering. And uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, government involvement with incentivizing technologies. Uh, what room do you think there is for uh, support in fundamental research and technology and improvements, uh, uh, either through funding um, or possibly through funding? On the government side, it seems like there's still room for growth. Uh, even though Tesla's on the road, I, I certainly can't afford it at this point. So. Um, <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> See him afterwards. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, I guess the point is there's there's a lot of private investment in this already. So you know, government investment is is I guess it's nice. It's it's something that that of course would help. But um, you know, there's plenty of private investment today because to an earlier point, um, the electric vehicle does have a number of of I'll call them benefits, but there's. There's an element to it that's that's different than driving a combustion vehicle, in that it's smoother. It's it uh, you know you're not using the brakes as frequently. It was called hybridization earlier, I guess, or hybridized, but it's sort of electrified. Electrified, you know, you get the regenerative braking to help you slow down. So there are aspects of it that make it um, better in a lot of ways, a lot a lot smoother and quieter, et cetera. So there's a lot of private investment in it already. Um, I don't think we quote need the government investment to make it happen. Last question. I'm Lana Ralston. I work with uh, Pi in Sausalito, an electric bike manufacturer. I pose this uh, uh, an idea to throw out in the wind. I, I think that <clears throat> regardless of uh, <clears throat> the uh, technology, the, the thing that I see most is a lot of people, uh, <clears throat> single driver occupant vehicles, I hear the average is about <clears throat> 26 miles per commute per day in the United States. And what if uh, uh, the federal tax code offered an incentive for uh, people to get uh, out of their cars a little bit or, let's say, uh, put them closer to work? What if... <clears throat> there was a tax credit for uh, moving within 10-mile commute of your work. That would reduce driver miles by 80%. Uh, I think uh, maybe that's an easy way to get policy moving in a direction that reduces our energy use. Let me, I'm, I'm gonna, you wanna... Yeah, let me, let me answer that real quick. Um, I think you, you bring up excellent point that uh, often gets ignored. You know, uh, new technology is really sexy and exciting, but uh, consumer behavior is a lot more adaptable sometimes than technology. So um, uh, carpooling and uh, moving closer to work and downsizing your car and um, th those kinds of activities immediately uh, pay for themselves. They don't require government incentives to change behavior, if if there are if the externalities become uh, non-external, become part of the market. And I think that's that's the critical issue: is how do you make a, a, a good mechanism to influence uh, behavior more along the lines of uh, social values? I think I've thought a lot about this in part because I was lucky enough to sell my Washington D.C. home in May of 2007. At that time, housing prices in the burbs were tumbling, but not really closer in. And there was clearly, because of the high fuel price, there clearly was a small advantage. The bummer is there's this nasty thing called the real estate market. And people were saying, oh, let's give, uh, let's allow you to borrow more money if you live closer in. And what does that do? That means there are more buyers for a given house. And if you're a house seller, it's happy days. If you're a house buyer, you're in trouble. So I think the other approach to this, how many of you take Caltrain or know where, know where Bay Meadows used to be? There's going to be 7,000 units there. 
and they're advertising it as potentially being, you know, transit oriented developments right next to the Hillsdale Shopping Center and next to the, uh, to, to the Caltrain stop, which we hope we still have. A key issue there is that a lot of people are saying, we, we can't have these homes near us. That, that'll raise our carbon footprint. To which my boss at Berkeley responded on the radio last year, yeah, and if they live in Solano County, the carbon footprint will be 10 times higher from how much farther they live to work. So that rather than saying, let's incentivize living near work, let's agree that we're going to use urban planning to make more homes available closer in everywhere and use transit-oriented development. And there are lots of tricks in the real estate markets and elsewhere to make that happen. If we just say, you get free money if you do this, then everybody like me is going to queue up to do it, and that might set the market uh, off in the wrong direction. But the point is well taken. The fact that there are people who work as medical assistants around the corner here in the medical center, and they're supposed to live really close to the hospital in case there was a disaster, like the unfortunate plane crash last month, okay? But they can't afford to live this close. And, and they can't be, you can't be living in Modesto and commute to the Stanford Hospital. So we have a real problem of this location. We're also facing another relocation problem. We're going to be relocating. Uh, what I'd like to do is thank all of our guests, some of whom came a long way. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.